Hey, Fashid, hi, how are you? Hi, Marcus, hi, very well, thank you. Sorry for the delay there, I don't quite know what happened, there's some gremlins in the, in the, in the system, I think. Where are you speaking from? From a home in London. It sounds like you're on the other side of the world, it's kind of weird, it's like there's a delay and um, you're a bit fuzzy, but it, it's fine, we'll, we'll, we'll plow ahead with it. So, you um, look like you're on a beach, Marcus. <laughs> well, you, I'm busted. <laughs> That's exactly where I am. <laughs> if only. So welcome to today's Screen Time, our live interview series as part of Virtual Design Festival, sponsored by Enscape. Uh, Fashid, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who are you and what do you do? Well, I am uh, an architect um, uh, based in London. I have uh, another kind of half, um, uh, my other half uh, hat is uh, an academic. I teach uh, at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. Uh, I do that half a year. So, you know, in the, in the half a year that I teach, um, um, you know, the balance shifts a little bit more to that side, but obviously uh, the office is, uh, continues to be, um, you know, my, my focus too. And in the other half, it, the balance shifts to the other side. And I've kept this teaching and practicing um, going ever since I've really left school. Uh, or let's say I've started my, my, my own independent practice, um, which, which I enjoy. It's, uh, a little bit more than what you would probably do, but uh, I think it's worth it. And in terms of the teaching, how has that been working since the whole pandemic started? Have you been teaching? Have you been doing it online? How, it, how is that going and how are your students faring? Yeah, I, I teach in the fall semester and just as I finished, you know, the whole thing started. Uh, so I haven't uh, experienced uh, teaching online myself. Uh, but curiously, since we've gone online, I've been able to join faculty meetings, which I wouldn't join because I would be away. And I feel a lot more connected, actually, to the school uh, since, uh, since this whole thing started. And, uh, you know, I've been invited to join juries and reviews and both uh, at, at, at the GST and other schools. So actually, I think it's possible. So you've been more involved since this happened then than before. Yes, yes. To be honest with you, I found myself more busy than I would at this point in the year, yes. And what about your architecture? How has it impacted your design process and construction and everything like that? Um, well, we have one, only once, one, well, two, two projects uh, on site. They stopped for a while and they restarted again. Uh, projects that are on the drawing board, um, actually with, with a little bit of, you know, we've all had to plan to work remotely uh, and we set, that our, set our, ourselves up um, just, just ahead of, you know, the official uh, lockdown. Uh, and we've been managing actually, I think quite well. Uh, it, there is a lot more management involved. Uh, that's the bit that is not the nice side of it because when you're in a room, there is a lot that goes on without too much planning and too much uh, coordination. Uh, there is a lot more need for coordination to make sure everybody knows what they're doing, everybody feels they've got sufficient feedback, that there is enough dialogue between all of us to make us feel like an office. Uh, but I think we've got it set up and it's working. And the last time I saw you, was it, was it about a year ago or 18 months ago, we went and had afternoon tea together. We went to look at your Victoria Beckham store in central London. Then we went and had tea and we were talking about department stores. You had a lot of ideas about how department stores were going to change. I guess they're going to have to change again. What are your thoughts on how the pandemic are going to, is going to influence architecture, the types of architecture that you do? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean we are lucky that we do, we are not specialized in one sector. Uh, so hopefully, you know, uh, some a sector, perhaps retail would slow down and, uh, you know, other sectors would, would uh, continue. Uh, but you're right that the world of retail, on the one hand, has, um, has of course, been shocked, sh you know, shaken uh, 
uh, because we are not going to shops. But on the other hand, online shopping has, uh, of course, um, you know, uh, escalated uh, to to something unimaginable. So uh, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I, I I haven't given up the idea that we are in a new world. I mean, I think we should learn from this from everything that has happened. Uh, but the idea that we would not socialize, we would not meet each other, we would not go to restaurants, we would not go to shops, we would not work together in one space, I'm not ready to give them up. And um, so what kind of projects are you working on? You've been working, is it finished now, that housing project you've been doing in France, is that completed now? We have, yeah, we have a new housing project now in France, but we, we completed two now already, uh, you know, a year and a half ago. Um, so we've got our new work, we've got the housing in France. Uh, our large project is uh, uh, an Ismaili center in Houston. Uh, that's keeping us, uh, you know, both very excited and busy. Uh, that's the kind of the large project of the office. We have, uh, we're working on a, a kind of a private residential house in, in Sussex. We continue to do retail work. We are working with Harrods now for a number of years. That's kind of ongoing. We are doing a competition, uh, which is curious because it it's, it's, was launched just before the lockdown, and um, you know the organizers have decided to proceed with it, which is which is very nice. It's a museum in Germany, um, so you know we are we are quite busy actually. Um, and and you're on the jury of um, of the Zine Awards this year, I think. That's right. I'm looking forward to. It. Um, we've heard from some of the other judges that, that from the past years that it's a little bit more work than you might have been told. So just giving you a little tip off, oh dear. <laughs> <like that. laughs> since okay. you've been saying how busy you are, but we'll, we'll yeah. do our best to make it manageable for you. And as you know, the, the deadline, the final deadline is coming up in just a few days time. I think you've prepared a presentation for us. Do you want to fire that up now? Share it with us. Uh, Can you see it? I can see that you're sharing, but it's it's just black at the moment. So there we are. Okay, now I can see the first image, yeah. Okay, you want me to fire away? Go ahead. <laughs> okay, so I thought that we would talk about um, architecture and micropolitics, which is a subject that um, we are very interested in, the work of the office. Um, could be described uh, with this kind of attitude or interest. Uh, and I thought we would use housing um, as a way to kind of delve into it because um, I think housing throws into question, uh, or let's say uh, housing can address a lot of concerns and, and questions that our contemporary uh, situation throws at us such as, for example, how cities can become more egalitarian, um, how we can acknowledge diversity in the city, how we can allow for autonomy, individual autonomy, as well as collective experiences, how we can allow for freedom or user empowerment in the private space and so on. These are uh, very large topics, uh, but I think uh, architecture has um, instruments um, which are in themselves small in scale, but have uh, profound consequences. Um, uh, and, and that's, I think, what is interesting to kind of, uh, perhaps to kind of to go through it together. Let me just go through my next slide. So perhaps, you know, we, I, I, I divided them into these kind of series of questions that we could, we could, uh, we could examine uh, through the lens of housing. So first, how cities could become egalitarian. Uh, we know that purposely built housing and mainstream housing divides housing into specialized kinds such as housing for the elderly housing for students co-living uh, obviously the housing family housing um, affordable housing luxury housing uh, and soon each one of these types of housing gets uh, thrown into different sectors of the city because of different differences of land value and how each one of these user types, you know, can kind of um, afford, um, uh, you know, to be in different areas of the city. So 
we all come to city to be together uh, to share knowledge and culture etc but we find ourselves that when we go home we are all segregated isolated from one another um, now what um, when we this is an image of our Nanterre project in, in France uh, it is a building that has students inside it has price capped apartments it has social housing uh, and it has penthouses but as you see in this image, it is impossible to see where the students are, where the price capped apartments are, where the affordable housing are, or the penthouses. Um, they all share the same entrances. They all have um, the exterior spaces that uh, we provided to all the units, two of them. Uh, they all have floor to ceiling height uh, glazing, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it's one way that we found uh, to kind of deal with the idea of equality in the city. People sharing one single spot together and people being treated, uh, you know, in the same way. Now, another question that I think comes about is um, how we can bring um, housing uh, in sync with contemporary lifestyles that kind of inhabit uh, the city, that we find in the city. Um, mainstream housing is still, you know, um, dealing, as I said, with separating people, but we have new kinds of households where people share the household, but actually they are two families. This is an example of people I know, Peter and Tessa with their daughter Cecilia Etedgui, who um, hosted um, Helen, who is a migrant, with her daughter Absalat for two years. So how do you design you know, a home for two families. Uh, and how do you anticipate this kind of situation when you are designing, uh, you know, a, a, a housing block as an architect? Well, one way we found out uh, to do it in our own projects is to uh, design um, the block with um, spatial variety. So apartments not only differing in kind based on size, but based on their spatial configuration. And you see on the left, the apartments in the Montpellier block and that we designed and the one on the right are the Nanterre one. And you see that there is variety. There is variety in outdoor space. There is variety in kind of uh, room kind and as well as size. And uh, this is done in anticipation that the inhabitants that come to buy an apartment in, the, in these blocks will find one that is closest to what their needs are. So if there is more choice other than just basic size. Um, the next question is, now when once you have a kind of a diversity, when you ac acknowledge that your, uh, the inhabitants, people that you're designing for are diverse uh, in needs, uh, how do you express them? Um, and uh, we, uh, find usually when we are seeing affordable housing that you know they tend to be designed as uh, blocks with punct punctuated windows, uh, either in render or in brick, um, as if um, we are marking these buildings, uh, these affordable housing, as buildings that are for people of less privilege, because glass and steel and especially full height glazing is reserved for luxury housing. Uh, this is something that we've challenged in our in our housing projects, uh, as you see here with the Nanterre block. It is made out of, you know, metal, uh, aluminium, steel, glass, full height glazing, and concrete. Uh, and the Montpellier block uses a similar palette. Uh, neither of them look like the traditional affordable housing um, uh, that kind of we we've got used to seeing, and that's really one of their you know, agendas to question how you express people in the city, uh, what kind of, if you like, identity you give uh, to, to, to people in the city. Now, one of the residents of our Nanterre uh, project building um, has recently told us that because the building is distinctive, um, he feels that the whole building is his and not just his apartment. And he uh, says that he feels that the other people in the building also feel the same way. And because they all share this feeling uh, towards the building, the building makes them a community uh, because the, it is something that they share in common, this uniqueness or this uh, kind of uh, 
a distinctness, distinct, distinctiveness of architecture. So I, I felt this was like a very interesting um, uh, way of looking at, you know, how buildings can be original and how they can nurture in people a sense of belonging. For me, it was really a kind of a delight to hear it. Um, now, another question is how can we allow for individual autonomy uh, in these blocks, given the fact that they are all uh, kind of different and they will want to live differently? Uh, I, uh, the image that you see uh, with the door handle um, on the left bottom, uh, it says on it, fucking guests of the fucking Airbnb, please close the fucking doors of the fucking lift. Otherwise, I'll have to walk seven fucking floors and I'm fucking um, 90. So this is a photograph of um, actually Vittorio Radice. I, I found it and I got permission to use it. Uh, I love it because it, it shows the kind of tension that you can find uh, in big block of flats and that people, just because people are living together in one building, it doesn't mean that they all are the same. It doesn't mean that they all want to become a collective because sometimes architects uh, get too quickly excited about uh, making people a community. Now, today we have other ways of becoming a community. Uh, we have an on life, uh, online uh, kind of life. Uh, we also form communities with our neighbors through neighborhood apps. Uh, I've got a, an image of it, the green one called Next Door Neighbor, uh, where people reach out to each other um, and um, use each other's differences uh, as an asset. You know, if you can fix my phone and I can teach you whatever, uh, these are exchanges that happen that bring also people together in a in much more meaningful way than the traditional way of saying, we have a long corridor and it's supposed to be a kind of a collective space or that we have a green patch of grass and people are going to become friends. Um, well before the residents of uh, Nanterre moved in, they had formed the, their Facebook page that you, you have a kind of a, an image of it here, uh, right bottom. Uh, and they are very active and they were already a community before the building was even there. So what we did with the, with the building, as you see on the plan here, is to forego the long corridor that you normally see uh, in these kind of long slab blocks that force people to go past each other's foot, footsteps. Uh, we've given each two apartments um, a vertical circulation course or a lift and a stair each two neighbors share only a small landing. Uh, this makes the units double aspect. We, as a result, we can give each unit um, uh, two outdoor spaces on either side. Uh, but most importantly of all, uh, you know, we minimize the inconvenience when people are really close to each other. But then we've given them lobbies that are extra large that we put kind of a nice table and chairs where they could meet there and I know they do. Um, so these are kind of, you know, just by how you organize and design the circulation core, you can make people, you know, feel that they can have more space, more autonomy within the block. Now, the other uh, question is, uh, you know, how do we also um, uh, allow for change? How do we uh, also acknowledge the fact that it's not that just people are different, their lives, our lives, uh, changes as we live in any one, you know, home. Um, this example at the top uh, is uh, from a, 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 a woman called Cecile, who uh, I know indirectly. She lives with her husband, has three children from two previous um, partners, and her new partners own two children. They sleep in the living room uh, where she has installed a simple separating wall between um, the living room and the bed, which, which you can just about see in the image. Uh, you know, her example shows that the typical night-day split that we continue to design flats or apartments um, um, with really doesn't work anymore. And that what we need to do is to introduce indeterminacy into the design of apartments. And uh, we also know that recently we've been working at home. We, we've all had to in our own ways, make changes inside of our homes in order to be able to work. Uh, the bottom right is me working in my, inside of my walk-in wardrobe. I found that, you know, the quietest place and a place I can shut uh, myself away and pretend I've gone to the office. Um, now, the question is, how do you do this? Um, you know, in, in, a, in a kind of a 
um, a, a kind of a real situation how do you anticipate for this and a way we've managed to uh, do it is to put all the structural load-bearing walls um, of the building between the neighbors so the black lines for example on the top plan are structural walls and the red lines all the inside partitions are non-load bearing so you know any um anyone occupying any one of the apartments can uh, you know take walls down put walls up turn it into a, a kind of a loft uh, as their circumstances change throughout their their kind of uh, life in the building uh, the same is the case with the Montpellier project. Uh, again, the load-bearing walls are not within the apartment, but uh, on the kind of the, the adjoining. Now, and finally, I would say, um, how do we respond to uh, our growing awareness of, uh, of the value of nature in urban life? Uh, this is perhaps the area that uh, is most, uh, I would say, unfinished in terms of what, what we'd like to do, but uh, as a kind of a start in both our uh, housing projects in France, we've introduced uh, ample um, outdoor space uh, on, you know, on, on uh, surrounding the units so that these spaces would be neither inside nor outside. And there are spaces that um, the residents can negotiate uh, as their circumstances change you know, to occupy it more as an inside space or outside space. Uh, some of them have shutters. Uh, these, these are the, the outdoor spaces of uh, Nanterre. And maybe I should also mention that uh, they vary in terms of how private or how exposed or social they are. Uh, again, uh, um, you know, taking into account that there would be different desires in this, in this sense. Uh, this is the Montpellier one. You, you can also see that you know, they differ in height, they differ in plant size, uh, exposure to sun, exposure to neighbors. Uh, and also it has curtains that uh, can enclose these outdoor spaces uh, from being an outdoor space to an indoor space. I don't know if I can make this video work. Um, um, And, and really my, my final slide is another one of the uh, residents, uh, in this case, uh, Gia, who lives in Montpellier with her partner. And we can see that, you know, these are kind of very uh, recent images of the lockdown and they're using their living room as an office. They're using the balcony as a gym. Uh, and I, I'm sure that many of us have, have had to find these kind of pockets of space uh, in places where we live. Uh, to do with this nature, I, I would like to kind of really finish by mentioning an architect that I um, admire a lot, and that's Jean Renaudy, who is not alive anymore, but he's a, he was a French architect, who was very much into questioning these issues. Well ahead of you know, what we are experiencing now, he was looking into making housing um, uh, you know, all around the idea of individuality, giving people a lot of personal freedom, uh, giving people a lot of choice uh, in terms of the kind of spaces they can occupy in a big block, uh, so that you would bring to people the kind of choices that they have if they were buying a house. When we're buying houses, we probably uh, you know, walk around and you know, go to many estate agents and uh, do a lot of viewing to find just the right house that fits our taste and our needs. I think when we get to apartments, we don't have that choice. They are much more standard. And he was very much about into, into giving this kind of choice in a big block, but he was also very interested in bringing nature. So his balconies um, were essentially gardens with a meter of soil and uh, with full of vegetation. And I think that that needs to be brought back. So that's, um, that's, that's the end of my presentation. <laughs> Thanks, Farshid. Could you unshare the screen so we can we can see you? It's interesting that you mentioned what was the name of the French architect you mentioned, John Fournadi or something? Renaudy. Renaudy. And you you because uh, I'd noticed when you showed both of those um, apartment blocks that one thing that was missing was vegetation. There's no there's no 
there's a trend now for putting trees on balconies or green walls all over them. Um, but there's no plants on the, the buildings themselves. Is that is that deliberate? Are, and also, are the tenants banned from having plants outside on their balconies? No, no. Uh, they are. They, we don't have plants, but there is a lot of uh, consideration, if you like, uh, towards the plant. There, there is a hose on the balcony of of each balcony, so that you can you can uh, you know water your plants. Uh, in the case of uh, Nanterre, we have glass uh, handrails and the glass uh, the city asked us to put fruit on it so that if people put kind of you know they put their bits and bobs that it doesn't kind of create too much clutter on the outside and we didn't have a problem with it i think that's just life but what we did was to start with a very dense um, fruit and then it fades out just when light needs to hit the plants and it's interesting you say that because when people were moving in, they first moved in their plants. And actually the balconies are full of pots and plants in the case of uh, Nanterre. Uh, in Montpellier, the balconies are very generous. So the idea is that you have space to put your plants, but you don't plant them into the balconies. Now, in Montpellier, we have quite large cantilevers to have introduced the height of soil into this cantilevers, uh, it we wouldn't be able to fit it within our budget. These are quite, you know, they are within the budget of affordable housing. Uh, so it's about, you know, what you, it's a give and take between what, what you give to people and what you, what you leave for them to finish. But I, we are, we are hoping that with the new project in, in Montpellier, um, we can introduce this element. It's interesting you say about having taps on the balcony. We had our house rebuilt recently, and the, the one thing that we got wrong is we didn't put a tap in the front garden. So when I water the plants in the front, it hasn't rained for two months. I have to drag the hose pipe through the entire house from the back garden. Really stupid little detail. But those two French projects you showed, who was the client? Was it a social housing a cooperative or you talked about there being some penthouses and and private residences there as well as affordable ones so what's the kind of ownership and management structure of those blocks yeah so uh, they are both um these two projects are both um uh, secured uh, both um you know by ourselves and by our clients through a competition so the city uh, sells the land um through a competition process and uh, private developers need to come along with obviously a financial offer for the land, but also with a design. So the, our clients set up a competition, us and two other kind of architects, French architects, uh, they chose us and then we had to go with them and present in front of the mayor to be selected for the project. Uh, in return, the city uh, gives quite quite a quite a specific prescription in terms of what goes in the building. Um, the ratio of affordable price capped students. We have three three floors of students from three different universities, and the only floor that our client could set the price freely was the top floor, which I refer to as 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 the as the penthouses. The rest is all uh, price controlled with the city. Um, now, Montpellier one doesn't have quite uh, this, the mix of people in it, but it is within what is called affordable housing. So again, the price has to be within that. So in both cases then, it's, it's, the, it's housing that has been kind of planned by the, the city in a way, even though the city didn't build it itself with its own money and its own contractors, it sort of designated, it decided what was needed for social purposes and then allowed the private sector to, to build it. Yes, I mean, I think the French have it really right in this, in this sense. Uh, it means that the city has quite a lot of control in terms of you know, the programming of it, the designing of it, because it's a design-led development. Uh, and they, it's just they put it in the hands of experts who know how to build to deliver it. Uh, I, I, I think it is, it is really great. It's quite different from quite the way different. things happen in the UK. That's right. I mean, I mean, I, you know, I'm very passionate about housing and I think we work very hard uh, 
at uh, trying to make a difference within the limitations of, you know, a privately funded project. Uh, and yet, you know, yeah, uh, we haven't attracted housing projects in the UK. Um, you know, I'm, 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 of course, I would love to, I, I would really love to work on housing in the UK, but it also needs to be uh, the right circumstances. Uh, you know, we, we do question uh, what, what it should be. Uh, we, we keep, you know, the time limit to what it is and budget to what it is, but then within that, uh, we would like to have room to discuss and interrogate, you know, uh, uh, the principles. Uh, and if that's not going to happen here, then maybe, maybe we shouldn't do it. And in France, that, that approach, is that quite normal in France? I think with the, with the ones that are competition, yes. If you get a direct commission from, a, a, you know, a private developer because they have a piece of land, I think probably uh, there wouldn't be, prob the, maybe the project wouldn't have the same level of ambition. But if they are done through this public-private uh, kind of uh, partnership, absolutely. And of course, in the UK, you have these Section 106 agreements. So if a private developer acquires some land and decides to put up luxury apartments, they might do a deal with the local authority to provide some affordable housing, which is almost always separate, has a separate entrance or even a separate block. And even in some cases, separate play space for the, for the children. And what do you think about that approach? And it's also open to the developer then saying they haven't got enough money to even provide the social housing. Is that, is that completely the wrong approach, do you think? Well, I love Section 106. I mean, I think it's a great, uh, you know, it, it, is, uh, it is a great setup uh, that we can actually expect the private sector to, to, to provide uh, affordable housing. Um, but I think it doesn't go far enough. Uh, there is a kind of a, you know, disconnect between that agreement and then planning, which is to do with design. Uh, and that's what is much more integrated in the French situation. You talked about, you said architects uh, get, get too excited about making a community as if architecture can create community. And it's funny that you were talking about next door and Facebook and in our street, we have a WhatsApp group that just started up during the pandemic. I met so many neighbors during the pandemic that I didn't really know before. But um, have you put in place architectural interventions to create community? Are there community spaces? Is there a kind of games room or a ping pong room or a garden that people can go together? Or have you just stayed away from that and just let people meet on the stairs or in the lobby? Or um, on Facebook? Yeah, we, 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 we We've got very large uh, lobbies that are double aspect. You go, you, you come in and you see like, uh, you know, greenery on the other side because there are actually two beautiful cemeteries uh, either side of the non tail project. And then we've um, put in, we've made, um, you know, beautiful um, uh, table with banquette style uh, in wood right in the middle of the space. Um, we are not saying to people, you must sit because that's not really our job. Uh, but we are hoping that it is more like a living room, that lobby, rather than a space that people simply go through. And I have heard from, from, uh, from a few of the residents that they meet there for drinks. Um, so, you know, I'm much more interested in um, putting in seeds for people to meet each other rather than forcing it. Um, so, you know, maybe the one that is most forced in the building is the fact that we have stacked people on top of each other, like the students and the different kind of um, households, and they do share these lifts. So the lifts are like a vertical street where you, you might, you know, for a while be next door to somebody that, you know, is from, is maybe of different interest to you. Um, but otherwise, it's, it's the kind of the lobbies are, are, you know, we don't have land around us. Uh, and I, what I should mention is that in France, uh, another thing that they do, which is different, is that every area, which they call ZAC, has a master plan that is, pla that is designed by the city. And every plot has a maximum buildable envelope, and you work within that. So um, we, we, you know, whereas in Montpellier, we have a garden around us. In Nanterre, we don't. We are just sitting on the plot. 
Um, and so we need to provide these kinds of spaces within. And uh, it is the big lobbies in this case. It's a very dense, uh, it's a dense block. And that mixing of different types of people, the students and private owners and elderly, that, that works, does it? Because again, that's something you wouldn't tend to see in the UK where you have almost ghettos of rich people, a student building, a, a service housing for the old, all completely separate from one another. I, I mean, I think it works. I mean, I mean, we, we keep in touch actually with, with all of our buildings and we've kept in touch with, uh, you saw some photographs. I, I uh, you know, we keep in touch with, with people who use our buildings and um, I, I think it's working. Uh, as I said, they like the building. They like it, if you like, originality. They have a Facebook. They, they share a lot of, they do things for each other, just like, you know, the neighborhood apps I was, I was uh, mentioning. And uh, it, in, in, in my opinion, uh, well, I'm very excited about the idea that um, without being forced, these uh, apps allow us to connect with each other and um, appreciate our differences. I mean, I, I dream of a day when, you know how when people um, are trying to find a school for their children and, you know, they, they have certain certain ideas of what makes a good school for them, let's say. Uh, I, I, my dream is that when we would look for a place to live, we would ask for its diversity factor. And the higher its diversity, the more desirable we think it is. Because, you know, it, it, people who are different to each other are, might, are going to be, you know, we learn from each other, our differences. We can do things uh, for each other because because you know that's kind of a um, we we fill each other's gaps, and so uh, that's that's kind of my dream actually. Uh, and I think the Nanterre building uh, we did we didn't design the makeup of you know the brief. It was the mayor of Nanterre, who happens to be uh, a communist, uh, and I think it's just just the perfect approach you know to to go about to to make cities really inclusive. Speaking about diversity, I mean, we're living at a time when that's been under the spotlight so much. I mean, there was a, a huge debate in architecture about gender balance a year or two ago. And now, of course, with everything that's happening in America with, with racial diversity, as, as a woman architect whose, whose background is from the Middle East, what are your views on, on that? What, what should be done? What can be done? What are the problems in your view and the solutions? Well, there, there are still not enough women um, you know, um, leading architectural practices. Uh, I, I think the, I, I think about it all the time because I, I know that, uh, you know, uh, unknowingly, um, it, it affects us, you know, uh, and, uh, one of the things that I'm always aware of is that when I go to meetings, uh, I am almost always the only woman in the room. And that's not an architecture problem. It's a problem of engineers. It's a problem of cost consultants. It's a problem of project managers. It, 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 so it's not, it's, it, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not architecture deals with a lot of other people. You know, we work with a lot of other people and maybe, maybe if, we were not raising the question only focusing on architects, but all the kind of uh, fields and um, you know types of people that work with architects, starting from clients to you know all the consultants, etc. Maybe we will better level the playing field, and maybe the idea of working with a female architect or maybe a woman wanting to start their own practice, it would just become a little bit more normalized, a bit more you know, um, um, yeah. Do you still find that then that, that you walk into the room as a female architect and it's all men and they, they, they react in a patronizing way or in a sexist way, does that still happen? It doesn't happen. Uh, I don't experience it because, you know, by the time people get to work with us, obviously they don't have a problem working with me, right? Uh, so, it's not a, it's more about looking at the fact that why is it that we don't have a housing project in the UK, you know? And 
it, it's, 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 it's when things don't come to you that you start thinking about it. People who work with us are amazing. I, I, I don't have any issue with any consultant, any client, any, you know, we are, we work really well together. And, uh, you know, we, those that we choose, we, we choose ourselves, those that we, they choose us. You know, uh, I think that's, that's not, I don't, you know, maybe earlier on in my career, also when I was working in different countries, you know, I, I noticed that the, the approach or the attitude towards a, a woman architect varies. Uh, but as I've got older, maybe I've also become more confident in not worrying about it <laughs> and just saying what I want to say and doing the work that I think we should be doing. Uh, but I do think there is a lot to be done. It's, it's an unfinished business. Let's move on from your housing work. What, what other projects have you got in the pipeline? We talked about retail earlier and you were talking about as I said last time we met about uh, department stores, but are you still working in the retail sector, or, or what other projects have you got in the? Uh, I mentioned to you. I mentioned to you the the Ismaili Center in in Houston. This is a project um, commissioned by the Aga Khan. Uh, it's essentially a kind of a cultural center, uh, primarily, of course, for the Ismaili community, but also open to anyone uh, in Houston. Uh, it has, you know. Uh, lots of different spaces, event spaces uh, that can be programmed in various ways. It's the, the mission of it is, is a building that brings people together. And uh, it sits in the middle of a, a kind of a big site, gardens. Uh, it hasn't been unveiled yet, so I can't tell you too much about it. But we are very busy and, and it is an exciting project. And in terms of your teaching, what are the specific themes that you're interested in? What are, what are the, the, the modules and the, the, the thoughts that you're sharing with your students? And what is today's body of architecture students like? What inspires them? What drives them? What do they, what do they want from their careers? Um, I have a position at Harvard, which is called professor in practice. So I try to take problems I find in practice and try to, in a way, fast forward them or work with them, uh, you know, outside of the constraints of, you know, real practice. Uh, and it has varied, you know, depending on what was, you know, I started there in 2005 and actually it was more retail. Then we worked for a while on, um, on, um, on airports and uh, museums because of course in the, in the kind of the mid to late nineties, there were a lot of museums being built. Uh, lately, during the last, I would say three years, I have been working on housing with, with the students. Uh, and uh, just because I think it, it is a kind of a, it's a very fertile ground for both learning about architecture and also um, coming up with new ideas. It, is, it needs new, uh, new ideas. Students, I think um, they are very, uh, I think they're very different, the students today, than perhaps in the 90s, in the early 90s, or, or even late 90s, um, with the computer, uh, or the digital being becoming the kind of the the foreground of everything, uh, and everyone being excited about uh, working with kind of more complex forms and uh, perhaps digital digital fabrications, etc. Um, I think it, it, that has gone in a way to one side because these things are now part of everyday reality of any uh, you know architectural practice. Um, we don't, you know, we are, we are too good at it perhaps now. Uh, I think there is a lot of, um, I think students now are interested to ask why. Um, and uh, that's, I think, a very, it's a great shift. Uh, I think everyone has activism, uh, you know, in their mind. I think, of course, the very recent situation has made us all uh, very aware of it. But I think uh, it's, it's great that it has you know, it has uh, entered uh, architectural thinking. Uh, and that's not to do with, you know, there was a time when, you know, perhaps activism was only connected with certain kinds of buildings, but I think that's something that is uh, shaping everybody's mind, you know, no matter what you're designing. I know you said your teaching is, is in the awesome semester. Awesome semester. Have you been Have you in been your students in, in the last couple of months? And Have I been are you hearing a weird echo now, by the way? No, 
No, but I lost you for a moment. Um, yeah, I think something's gone strange with gone the strange audio. With the audio. <laughs> I keep hearing myself. Um, um, have you been in touch with the students in the last few weeks? weeks? Are they responding to what's going, going on? Are they, are they terrified or are they determined that they're going to use this as, as, a, as a chance to, to, to change the world when they, they graduate? Yeah, during the last few weeks, I haven't, I haven't talked to any of them, but I follow them on you know, social media and I, I see that they are very active, you know, making posts and um, wanting to be behind, uh, you know, all the kind of, um, uh, I think, um, uprising that, that is uh, going on. Uh, you know, at the GSD, uh, I, uh, there is actually quite a lot of, um, there is a quite a lot of um, uh, sensitivity uh, towards uh, these issues, uh, independent of just now, uh, both to do with race and also with gender. And a number of times, the whole school has been plastered with, you know, banners. Uh, and and I think this is great. I mean, you know, architecture. You know, us we as architects, we design for people. And we really need to be connected with what's out there, and be be a, both both participate as citizens, but also transfer those kinds of uh, knowledge also into architectural decision making. Uh, and I, yeah, I'm not worried about them. I think uh, I think the current the, the the new generation of students and graduates are going to make very great citizens. I should finally we have a we have a from our online audience ben asks do you believe that this mixing of people of different class and background is in any way pushing people to comply to an identity that you have given them through the building a density Aden identity oh identity pushing them to comply to an identity um I i'm not really sure if i understand the question well um i I think buildings, you know, every building has an identity. And when you, uh, you know, when you occupy it, uh, in a way you become part of it. Uh, so I think that that's, that's a given, no matter what it is. What we tried to do uh, with the building in this case was not to, um, you, you know, not to express uh, people through the idea of wealth, you know, or size. Uh, and to express people equally, uh, make them equally uh, belong to the building. That's how we did it. But I think on the question of identity, I don't think you escape it as an architect, whether you design a brick block or a branded block or a glass, you know, it, it has an identity. And in a way, oh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Um, in a way you answered the question already because you said that residents in the building one of the residents said that they saw it as his building not just his apartment in the building but is his his building uh one more question could you ask Fashid when she was starting out how did she go about the fear of being on site and managing work contract administering I have just qualified and feel anxious about contract admin stage five work in general very specific that's question funny. that's sweet um well I tell you what um we all have different beginnings and I was incredibly lucky because my first building was a, a 48,000 square meter building. And people think doing a big building is harder, but actually when you do a big building, there are a lot of people who work with you and you don't do the, I didn't do the contract administration, uh, but I was working on a very large building. Um, we are doing now a small house uh, in Sussex I think it's a lot more work because you have to do everything by yourself. So, um, yes, I didn't go through that fear. I had other fears, uh, but but uh, it's never it's never easy. But uh, actually, I think once you go through those, um, uh, overcome those fears, then you become fearless and and you know you move on. Because for anyone who's watching who doesn't know your story, you you were part of Foreign Office Architects and you entered an anonymous competition, <coughs> excuse me, for Yokohama Ferry, Ferry Terminal. And then you won. You won this massive project when you were just a beginning in your architecture career. So your story is not quite typical. No, no, it's true. 
And then final question, Greg asks, are these competitions, I presumably the ones in France, open to all architects or are the teams pre-selected by the city? Is anyone able, is any developer able to, to, to come up with a design? And do you need experience of that kind of project to be eligible? Yeah. Um, there are two types of competitions in France. The city sometimes launches their own competitions and that's for social housing and anybody can apply. And of course, for as long as we, didn't, we are in the EU, anybody in the UK can apply. Um, then there are these other ones where they, you need to be, you need to go be part of a team of a private developer because it's developers who are actually entering the competition. And then it's the developers who select and who have their competition. And that's when you need to, you know, send your portfolios and introduce yourself to these developers so that they might invite you uh, to the competition. So in the case of uh, the Nanterre and Montpellier, we were invited. Okay. Bashid, thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. If I've been acting a bit strange the last few minutes is because the computer is playing my voice back to me with a delay. So it's been really freaking me out a little bit, but it's okay. As long as you okay, that's the main thing. It's all so good. I hope to meet up with you in London for tea before yes. too long. Do that again. Yes. Let's do that. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.